Spanish one. And apparently it took a year for him to decide that yes, he's going to be registered as a Jew in Poland. He was afraid that he wasn't going to have enough opportunities for education later on. In any case, coming back, so the pseudonym Janusz Korczak was adopted by um, Henry Goldschmidt when he was 19, when he sent a, um, a piece of writing to a writing competition and he needed to give a pseudonym. And uh, the book that he had next to him was from a famous Polish um, writer. And the title of that book was Janusz Kar Korczak, but unfortunately the typesetter made a mistake and that's why it's Janusz Korczak, but that's his pseudonym. So what happened between the two wars, um, he was already very famous and there were people from all over Europe coming to the orphanage to learn. And the Polish radio decided that they are going to have this program on Sundays. I think it was like five or six o'clock on Sunday where the kids all over Poland could call. There were six numbers, six telephone numbers that the kids could call and ask questions. And the kid would call and doc all doctor would answer, the, answer the, the child. But what was found out very soon into it, that most of the listeners were actually the parents because they found his speaking so inspirational, not only so loving, but also so humane as far as the interaction with the child that they really were benefiting from it. Unfortunately, that program ended in 1936 because of the antisemitism. And although he was speaking under the pseudonym, the radio could not uh, keep him as a Jew uh, to continue that program. Now he had uh, the two orphanages, one a Christian one and one a Jewish one. And what year did the orphanages begin? The first orphanage started in 1912. He was um, approached by Stefania Wyczynska, who had a lot of contacts with um, very rich fundraisers in Warsaw. And because it was such a dire situation with all the slum, Jewish slum children between the two wars, she managed to secure the funds and the Korczak uh, created a plan. In two years, they built the Jewish orphanage on Krochmalna Street, which was 1912. When 1914 happened, Korczak was called to the front for the World War I as a doctor. And he ended up being for four years on the Russian front. After the war in 1918, he spent three days in Kiev. And what do you think he did? The first thing that he did was he looked for the orphanages in Kiev. And he ended up going to one of the orphanages that was run by Maria Fal um, Falska. And it was just a chaos. And during those three days, he introduced the staff of that orphanage to his methods. And he told uh, Maria Falska, come back to Poland, come back to Warsaw, I will help you start the, the Polish orphanage. He never really wanted to separate these orphanages. He wanted both Polish kids and Jewish kids to be together, but there was no way in, the, in Poland between the wars to have something like that. So she came back in 1919 and with his help, they co-founded a Polish orphanage uh, in Warsaw. Thank you. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll have many more questions about that during, the, um, during our discussion later. But what I would like to ask you is, is how do all this translate into an organization that you formed? So in 2007, I decided to form a not-for-profit called Shining Mountain Center for Peaceful Childhood. It's an organization really for children who come to my practice with their parents. And I wanted to, be, to have an umbrella of different uh, projects that were under it. The, uh, from the very beginning, the organization has been dedicated to Janusz Korczak. But then through my different contacts with the International Korczak Organization, because there are actually 26 uh, um, Korczak organization worldwide, uh, I decided that it was time to really start uh, Janusz Korczak Association of the USA because all these international organizations were asking us to have something from US. And so in 2013 with five other people and Marcia was one of uh, the founding uh, people, we started a Korczak Association. So now uh, the Korczak Association is under the umbrella organization and I encourage you to go to our website, KorczakUSA.com because it's a very rich place 
to learn about many different projects that we have and also to, to learn about Dr. Korchak. Are there any orphanages in um, anywhere in the world that are using some of his methods? Are there any schools that are using some of his methods today? In uh, the, con the 26 countries that right now have the, uh, the Korchak associations, many of them are running foster homes based on the methods of Janusz Korczak. I know that there is an orphanage in Thailand that is run like, um, like uh, Korczak organization. And there are many schools all over the world that are using the principles of Korczak pedagogy in, in their curriculum. For example, if you are, if you, you are trying to be a t um, teacher in Poland or Russia, there are many universities where the fifth year is going to be totally dedicated to pedagogy of Janusz Korczak. And the students do a lot of training in orphanages, they do training in foster homes, they do training in children's hospital to using his methods. Wow. And what are some of your hopes for the future of the organization? For me, the most important right now is really to find a home for Janusz Korczak um, Research Institute. I would really, I imagine a place next to maybe a university that would adopt his pedagogy where they would use his methods and teach it during the, um, during the training for the teachers. Because I find that my going to schools, my going to camps and teaching is not enough because I'm just one person. And, it, and I think that his methods are really very important and it's really very important in our times to give the children the voice also in the classroom, not only at home, but in the classroom. Well, thank you so much, Mariolo. I think you've inspired uh, all of us here this evening to, uh, to follow uh, Korchak, to read his uh, children's books, his writings, and uh, hopefully there'll be some people in the audience who are educators who maybe will take forth uh, some of uh, Korchak's vision in educating uh, children uh, today. Uh, of course, you'll all get a chance to ask questions. Just write them in the chat and we'll be able to have them after we have our next speaker, uh, Marsha Talmadge. Marsha was a teacher and principal in the New York City public schools and also in Jewish day schools. She is the author of Janusz Korczak, Sculpture of Children's Souls. And I wrote the epilogue for the book, uh, which was published by uh, Ward Smithy. Uh, and Marsha, I would like to ask you to begin to tell us a little bit about how did you get interested in Korchak? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. And <clears throat> both Mariella told a lot of wonderful information as well. Um, in 1972, I was teaching in a Jewish day school in Albany, New York. And there was a special presentation for Yom HaShoah, the Memorial Day for the Holocaust. And I had never heard of Yadush Korchak before that. And I had studied a lot about Jewish history and so on, <clears throat> but I'd never heard of him. And I, I was very taken by the utter bravery and heroism of this incredible man, but more than that, his love for children. The program talked about the last chapter of his life. And that was indeed very, very sad and heroic at the same time, tragic and heroic. But yet he showed that he would not leave his children even though they were all going to perish at Treblinka, the death camp. And he kept, he had an incredible preparation for the children. He had told them to take their favorite toy or the favorite book. And they just knew, he, he really knew the spirit of the child. So I started to look around and at that time there was nothing in English. I was quite surprised. There was no Wikipedia or, or anything. We're talking about 1972. And slowly I discovered a few years after that, this book, The Holocaust, with one chapter about Janusz Korczak. And that was it nothing more. And I, <clears throat> in 1983, I went to Israel 
Wait a minute. You first went in 1972. You went to Yad Vashem. Not in 1972. In 1983. Okay. Okay. And I had a class of about three weeks in very intensive class uh, for teachers about the Holocaust with many different experts and uh, uh, it was incredible. And Korchuk's name came up and I was told that the ghetto fighters kibbutz in the north, not far from Akko and Naria, had an archive. I went up there and um, discovered there was a lot of information, but it was all in Hebrew. Well, at the time, my Hebrew was kind of weak, not as good as it is today. And I bought the books anyway and said, one day I'll, I'll be able to get into them and so on. came back and started to think more about this incredible man. And about a few years after that, the book that was mentioned before by Betty Jean Lifton was written. And she had done an enormous amount of, of research um, and it has been re-edited re and redistributed now. What an incredible man. Anyone who loved children as much as he did just captured my heart. And but you clearly also had a love for children being a teacher and a principal. Well, I think that it's not every principal, as you know, loves kids so much. But I do. I, to this day, even though I've been retired for quite a few years, I still love kids. And uh, that's what drew me so much to this incredible man. And um, I don't know how much more you want me to, he, he talked. Well, you, I, then, you then went on to uh, 1998 when you visited Eastern Europe and you want to tell us a little bit about what happened on that trip. Okay, I visited Warsaw at the time before the incredible that museum that is now there, um, visiting some of the sections. And I asked the tour guide, could we please go to 92 Krachmalna Street? And I am sure I was the only person, who, a, a tourist, that had ever asked this tour, tour guide about this. And this is exactly where the orphanage was. And he changed the whole uh, schedule and we went to the orphanage. I just had to see it. Um, it as one enters, as, as Mariola said, it, it was a brand new building. It was the first building in Warsaw that had heat and hot water. And, um, as you enter the building, even to, it's still standing today. And by the way, so too is the second orphanage that was meant for the Christian children. Um, I went into this giant hall, which was used as their dining room and also um, study room. And later during the day, they played games. Um, by the, one of the incredible innovative ideas that Korcha came up with was to have university students spend four hours with the children every day and act like brothers and sisters, big brothers and sisters, and they would get a, a, a stipend. And being students of, uh, in a university, of course, extra money was important. Um, the children were really shepherded by their university student, by their peer counselors. They also, so this room also had a smaller room where it was called the quiet room. I went into this quiet room and I could just hear the voices and the giggles and the smiles of the children. Wow. Now, the quiet room was used specifically for anyone, any of the Jewish kids, who wanted to pray. Now, some of the Jewish kids had some very strong Jewish background. There was one person I spoke with who told me that he came into the orphanage with, with, with the side locks, with payas. And um, he, he went into that room and he, he would pray every morning. There was a huge sign of the Mode Anim morning prayer. And very often, Korchak would go in there with, even though he was not at all religious, he didn't know very much about Judaism. As, as was mentioned, he was, came from a very assimilated home. 
Um, but he wanted his children to know that he was there for them. Judaism was something that was not very known to him. So he made sure that some of these peer counselors taught the kids something about the Jewish holidays. Wow. He especially liked the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah and Passover. And I'll tell you a little bit about- Let's get, why don't we just get back to the continuation of uh, your trip in Eastern Europe. You then went on to Treblinka and what happened to you there? Okay, so uh, Treblinka, by the way, is very close to Warsaw. That is the next step that we went to. Treblinka has oval stones, 11,000 oval stones, no names except for one. And that one name on the stone is of Janusz Korczak and his children. I got closer to that monument and I saw some Yorkside candles at the foot of the monument and next to the Yorkside candle was a note written by a girl from Albany where I had started my journey getting to know Janusz Korczak. It was such an aha moment. I just knew that that was something, a signal that I needed to do something more in regard to Janusz Korczak. And then a few years later, you in 2001, you went to Israel for six months. And tell us a little bit about how you got to interview the people who had lived in the orphanage and how you found these 10 people to, uh, to interview. I'll, I'll be happy to tell you. Um, I went, I, I needed to go to, again, to the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz, where there is an archive. I saw Korchuk's own handwriting in the original letters, some of the letters that he had written, which absolutely blew my mind. Very, very fancy kind of writing and so forth, uh, European style. And I had a tape recorder. I had 10 names from the archives of people who were presently living at that time in 2001, who were living in Israel. 10 people, my little old fashioned tape recorder, and I went throughout the country and interviewed these people. And I, I have to say, they made him come alive. These people left the orphanage years before, but they were so, he, his spirit and, and the time that they spent in the orphanage just was so engrossed in their lives, their families' lives, even some of their professions. Um, I, one of the important things that took place during the uh, orphanage were clubs, clubs. Korchak had um, a photography club, a, a carpentry club, a sewing club, a gardening club, um, a painting club, or, and a chess club. And probably others, but those are the ones that I, I want to talk about now. Um, one of the people I interviewed was quite, a, they were all in the autumn of their lives, but, uh, and some of them were children, orphans, and not total orphans, but some of them maybe lost one parent. And because the, econ the economy was so difficult for, if it were one parent to take care of a bunch of kids, they were sent and, and accepted into the orphanage. So one of the men was quite old. He had just had some operation and was recuperating. And he said he was waiting for his caretaker. And his caretaker was from Russia and he was, had started to play chess with his caretaker for the first time in over 50 years, something he had learned in the Korchak orphanage. And he was all excited that he was going to be able to play chess. Another person <clears throat> learned his profession of photography at one of the clubs. And in those days of photography that he learned it, he had to go into a dark room and he actually really did the whole process of, of developing a, a, his film and then a, a photography. And the same man told me in another unbelievable story I'd like to share. 
as I we mentioned that Korchak came from quite an assimilated family and came Passover time, everybody was taught all kinds of songs for the Seder, the ritual um, uh, meal and uh, ceremony, the first two nights of Passover. And Korchak devised a system that was just for him. And I would love to see more people who are listening to acquire this custom as well. And that is, Shlomo Nadal was telling me, remember there were a hundred kids, they were eating at the Seder. Korchak had, instead of having one child win the Afikomen prize by looking around and searching or bargaining with the, the head of the Seder, Korchak devised one walnut inside a matzo ball. One out of a hundred kids, how many matzo balls? 200 matzo balls, I don't know. What was the choice, chance of winning? This man, Shlomo Nadal, who just died maybe two years ago, was eating his soup and of course he found the walnut inside his matzo ball. As he was telling me the story, he took out of his pocket a disheveled brown handkerchief in which was his prized afikomen walnut. It was awesome. And uh, I just think that's a very special story. That's a beautiful story. Um, there are many, many other stories. We, uh, someone, Mariola, mentioned that he, he measured and weighed every single child every single week. And he had a, every note that he, and he observed everyone throughout the day. He'd go into a corner and he'd take notes in his little notebook and put it in his khaki colored lab coat. Now, we all know many doctors to this day would wear white lab coats. In those days, of course, it was, that was the, the norm. Korchak wore this green khaki one. He didn't want the kids to be afraid of him. They, one woman told me about when she first came to the orphanage, you notice how he uses his, his um, methodology. In this story, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about even closer. This young girl came, she was maybe six or seven years old. And of course, being new, she didn't have any friends or playmates. So she was off to the side by herself. Poor Chuck noticed that and all the other kids were playing by themselves. Korchak picked this girl up, put her into a tree, and she started to scream, of course. She was frightened. And the more screaming she did, the more her kids would come closer to her. And Korchak was, put her, put her down, put her down. She was screaming. It didn't. Now, the kids, just one, let me finish the sure. kids. The kids refused. You gotta let her go. Take her down, put her down, put her down. And they finally did because they said, we'll take you to court. Remember someone mentioned that he had a court of, a court of justice where the kids and one adult would sit every week and make judgment on some problems that might have occurred during the time. And this is one perfect example. They took him to court and of course he got the least amount punishment, which was 100. And 100 really meant just don't do it again. That was the big punishment. He also got another time of a punishment once when he <clears throat> slid down the banister from the second floor to the first floor. Now, you know, kids like doing stuff that's a little bit risky like that. But because he had such a sense of humor, and he also wanted the kids to know that he was also, you know, a little bit of a, a, a rebel, a rebel. And so he, he went down the banister. And when I went to visit the home, I had to see that banister. And I took a picture of that banister and put it in my book as well. <laughs> so... Well, but you can see how, what, what creative ways he uses to empower 
empower the children. Now, uh, Korchak had a, uh, a woman who was very helpful to him in running the orphanage, Stefa. And I feel that she's very often left out of uh, the work that was done with the children in the orphanage. Could you tell us a little bit about Stefa and her role? And um... She was co-director with him. They both had very similar ideas on how to raise a child. And you're right, very often she is not mentioned in, 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 in terms of her, not given her total worth because she was a co-director. And remember, <clears throat> Mariola said that during a certain period, Korchak was not there at the orphanage. He was in, in military. So she really ran the show much of the time. And her, she was, both she and Janusz Korchak were like father and mother to these children. Uh, one of the people that I interviewed told me that they didn't have pictures of their parents, but a picture of Janusz Korchak on the wall it was like a grandparent to the children. And um, she, Stefa, uh, together with Janusz Korczak, Mark re prepared the children for the end. By the time uh, August 1942 came around, they knew the things, they had moved three times in the ghetto. Things were smaller and smaller quarters for the children. Both she and, St and Janusz Korczak knew things were not well, and they prepared the children by doing a, a play about a young man who was waiting for a letter to tell him something important. It was written by Tagore, um, the Indian uh, uh, playwright and poet. And in any event, Korchak led the group of two, 197 children. They were in rows of four, marching many miles from the orphanage to the deportation place, the, the Umschlagplatz. Uh, he was at the head. Children were holding their favorite toy or book. And Stefa was at the end. Seven members of the staff marched with them. Many times, Korchak's colleagues would say to him, you don't need to stay there. We will help you get out. We can make false papers for you. You're so, he was so well known, uh, very, very well known. But no, he said, these are my children. Yeah. And, and they, they marched to their death. We, yeah, it was a very, very sad, very, very sad end. And that's why, you know, I think he definitely was an, a martyr. But uh, just a few other things of in terms of what happened during, uh, after the Germans invaded Poland, uh, September 1, 1939, and particularly the bombing in, in Warsaw was really quite severe. And the Jews were put into, uh, into ghettos quite, uh, quite early. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened to the Jewish orphanage uh, after uh, the Germans took over? Okay, they, they were forced to move, as I say, actually three different times in the, in the uh, ghetto. Uh, each time being more and more crowded, each time having less and less food for the kids. Korchak went, even though he by that time was in his early 60s and he had all kinds of illnesses, he went to many different charities looking for money to buy food. And um, um, there was an incident where he was uh, put in jail because he, he refused to wear his yellow um, um, armband um, and it, it, many different things happened, but they they continued on having the kind of spirit that he had in the school in the orphanage that kept them going. He he really gave them an awful lot of love, a lot of respect, and that helped them. Wow. Now, thank you so much for publishing uh, Janusz Korczak, Sculpture of uh, Children's Souls. The book was published in uh, 215 by Wirt Smithy. Uh, 
Uh, thanks to uh, Jeanette Friedman of the word Smithy. And can you tell us a little bit about the reception of the book? And I understand it's also been translated into several languages. Right. Uh, some have already been published. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your experience in, uh, in uh, Poland, yes. the Ukraine? Um, okay. Um, uh, I, at one of the international conferences that Mario spoke about, I met a woman who was president of the Ukraine Janusz Kochak Association. And her son happened to have been the professor of your son, Eva. And somehow when they were in New York, they came to me to talk with me and made an additional uh, contact. And um, the woman, the, um, her name is Svetlana, and she was so taken by the book, she brought it home and gave it to her, the English teachers in her school who had the children translate from English into Ukraine as a, a, I think, two or three month project. And the whole school, I think three different teachers had the children translating into Ukraine. They then had a, a donor give some money to help it be published. They invited me to come. My husband and I went to, you, to Kiev uh, two years ago to the school. It was such an awesome experience. They were, they were, they were just, they couldn't, couldn't get enough. And they're English. I was dumbfounded. Um, and this is the copy of the book in Ukraine language. Um, it has been translated into Russian. Uh, because of the COVID, we did not go to Russia, to Kazan, to uh, see the, another person that we met, I met at the Yano International Janusz Korczyk Association. Also, I had some, um, the, the president of the International Association introduced me to uh, someone who would translate from English into Hebrew. It's been translated into Hebrew. I have to find the right publisher in Israel too. And maybe one day it'll be published in Polish too, as it should be. So yeah, those I are think that would be an amazing, amazing tribute to them. And I think the uh, one thing we have to know, by the way, of the 10 interviews, there was only one child who had been there in the early part of, uh, in the early part of the war. And then he escaped to the, uh, uh, to the Russian part of uh, uh, either Uzbekistan or Siberia. Uh, and, uh, but all the other children are children who uh, were in the orphanage before World War II and had escaped to Israel. Did Korchak, what was Korchak's relationship to Israel since we have these kids who went to Israel? Right. Uh, in that time, in the 1930s, there was a, a very strong sense of Zionism and socialism uh, in Europe, and that it spilled over to Israel, and many kibbutzim, the collective farms, were established at that time. And one in particular, for some reason, had a lot of Korchak um, graduates, in quotation marks. And uh, Stefa went to visit these kids, and she came back, and she told Korchak, and he went to Israel twice in 1934 and 36. And um, two very short visits. One was about a month and the other was six weeks. And he was very impressed with the kibbutz because he liked the idea of collectivism, that everyone was working towards a, a, um, a collective goal. Um, but he did not like the fact that children did not sleep with their parents, which, which has since right. been changed in kibbutzim um, today. There's almost no real collective anymore also, but that's beside the point. He, he, he considered, he dreamed of having a, uh, an orphanage in Jerusalem and he, he wrote about it and, and dreamed about it, but obviously never happened. Well, thank you, Marsha, for giving uh, Korchak a posthumous life. Uh, that he so well deserved and for giving the children an opportunity uh, to speak uh, 
to speak about him. Uh, we're going to show you a brief collage of some um, uh, some of the works, and uh, and then uh, please write questions and uh, and Marsha and Mariola uh, Stralberg will be uh, very happy to answer some questions. I'm sure you have many questions. A lot of questions have come in already. Okay, great. David, you want to show us the uh, collage? Sure. That's the orphanage. By wait, at the top, the top uh, is where the, the, you see the round that that little window there. That's where Korchak lived in his one room, one desk, one chair, one one bed. But he opened the windows all the time and was known for feeding the birds. He even gave names to the birds. The the, the people I interviewed um, told me about that. Thank you. That's Stefa right next to him on his right. We look at, we see it on the left, but it's on his right. He was very formal. Wow. You, have to, you have to remember that most there there is the picture from one of the films. Maybe that's the one from Waja's film. That's already in the ghetto. That's the picture from the ghetto. Uh, he made sure that anybody who played a min musical instrument played. Uh, one of the people, I don't know if it's one of these men or young boys, uh, established a, a children's orchestra in one of the cities in, in Israel, by the way. Or in the, that's, that looks like maybe, I don't know, in, maybe in Israel, because they're wearing shorts. The men are wearing shorts. And this is a sculpture outside uh, in, in Poland. In Warsaw. I think outside of the, the museum. This is when Korchak started the orphanage and he was uh, the Jewish orphanage and he was really happy to to have all these children that he could learn about. And here they are. That, that's something, by the way, they, they didn't have any servants. There was a cook, but the children helped in everything, in setting the table and bringing the food to the table. The food was cooked downstairs. There was a, a dumb waiter that brought the food upstairs and Everybody had a, a, a job to do, uh, absolutely every job, not just for food, but throughout the house, they cleaned themselves. We can all learn that lesson very well these days. Unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, and, and now, uh, uh, why don't we take the first question? Uh, Kel, I sent Kel a bunch of questions. Kel can okay. read them. Unmute yourself. Okay. okay. All right. I'm back. Hi. So we have quite a few questions. We're trying to get to as many as possible. Uh, if you have any other questions after the Zoom is done, you can always email 3GNY or 2G New York and we'll get the answers for you. Uh, we had an interesting email last night that Mariola got to see, which was from someone who believes that someone, some of her relatives had been in the orphanage. And she wanted to know, is there a list of the orphans that were in the Jewish home available somewhere so we can know the names of the children that were there? So I contacted the uh, ex-president uh, of the International Korchak Association, Batya Gilad from Israel. She doesn't think so, 
but I'm waiting for the answer from the Korczak archives from Warsaw and also Polish Association. We will see, maybe it's possible to find it. And the best would be also if um, the person has pictures maybe, um, because that could be very helpful too. Absolutely. And are there any children from the orphanage alive today? I interviewed, I said 10. Out of those 10, there's one still living. He learned his okay. trade. His, he was, um, he is an artist. And uh, Korchak and Stefa allowed him a space. He talked about getting materials from them in a space, a specific space. He remembered it very vividly. He's the only one who's left. Um, it, it's, very remarkable and I'm so thankful that I had the chance to talk with every one of these people um, in 2001 because there's just one left. When I, was, how, when, how when I was in Poland when I was in Poland in 2012 I have met actually few people who are still alive from the Polish orf uh, orphanage and um, that was 2012 and uh, Maria, um, Maria Falska also wrote quite uh, a lot and there are books about the Polish orphanage, but they were not translated into English yet. Okay. And was he ever married? No, he was not. Um, and she was not. They were both bachelors. They, there was no uh, relationship other than a working relationship from what everybody, all the people who have ever done any research on them. Um, he really dedicated his whole life to the children, and so did Stefa. But one of the other things that influenced him was that his father, uh, who had been, who would, was a lawyer, he, they were really middle, upper middle class people. Um, his father became very mentally ill, and that being a doctor influenced Korchak to never want to have children because of that. I see, I see. And actually, I just got a very interesting uh, message from Judy Faderbush. And she said that her grandmother actually met Korchak when he was a publisher of the children's supplement in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. She was actually not in the orphanage herself, but she was a friend of, the, of a girl who was in the orphanage. Her oh. grandmother was from a Hasidic family and she had written a poem about feeling like a bird trapped in a cage. And uh, Korchak met with her and published her poem anonymous, anonymously. And for the first time, she felt heard. I think that's a, that's that's a lovely good. story. Yes. Uh, we would love for the story if the person who just sent the information to you, if she would be able to write it up for us, I would be very happy to put it in our newsletter because we have newsletter that comes out and MailChimp messages to the Korchak Association uh, list. It would be wonderful because it's Absolutely. something we didn't hear about yet. So we have one more important question we can get to. How can we adopt his methods in the world of today? And how can we influence today's teachers to use his methods? The most important thing is really to start studying his methods. So I always say, start with the biography and the king of children, because there are a lot of in very important ideas there. The second one is to really look at the book, How to Love a Child. And we can contact Korchak USA. You can call, contact also International Korchak Association and learn the, the methods. You can also find out from um, Yad Vashem has quite a lot of information about Korchak also. And we are trying to actually prepare some teaching methods so they would be ready for the teachers to use. But it's a slow process. And if the person is interested in helping, we would be very happy to adopt them. I, I would like I would like to add that uh, you know I think that part of teacher education when uh, people get uh, a uh, a BA or an MA in education that there should be one course on uh, on teaching Korchak's methods. In addition to that, we had. Uh, we had uh, Koberg from Harvard University, who also was using a lot of uh, Janusz Korczak's methods. And uh, when I was uh, uh, leading the, um, 
the foundation for Christian Rescue, which, which today is the foundation for the righteous. We also developed the curriculum using the rescuers of Jews uh, during the Holocaust to develop moral education as as communities, and we use some of uh, and we use Korchak's ideas of empowering uh, students as well, and not having you know the kind of hierarchy uh, that we have uh, that we have today. So I think you know with Mariola uh, setting up some of the uh, some of the new teacher training material. Uh, I think, you know, the first place is to try to get it into, uh, into universities for new teachers coming in. And obviously, there's a lot of teacher training that goes on for teachers. And, uh, and that should be another place to try to develop, uh, to develop some of these methods, which I think is going to be something that, uh, that is quite helpful to young children today who want to feel the sense of acceptance and love and, uh, and to reduce this hierarchy uh, of power that we have today and uh, to make it a place where children can learn how to make decisions that ultimately helps them become much more independent as they, uh, as they grow older. And also, I would like to direct you again to the Korchak USA website. Because when you go um, to that website under the legacy, um, you will see that there are many different things that we have been doing in the United States. And one of the things, for example, is there are teachers around the United States who have developed already uh, ready-made curriculums that they are using either in Holocaust classes. And th there is one teacher in Spokane, Washington, who teaches a Holocaust block using Janusz Korczak's uh, biography and the children create poems. It's a found poetry project. There is another project in Pittsburgh where the, the teacher is using court methods inside the classroom. You know, when I go and teach the Five Star Program, it's, um, it's allowing the, t the children to have the voice to be able to say, am I paying attention or not? If I'm not paying attention, can I get up and ask the teacher to go to the back of the room and have a one minute break? You know, through those little um, things, we can also encourage the child to have a voice. I also would like to mention one more very important thing. Janusz Korczak is considered really the father of children's rights. He was the first one who actually created the code uh, of children's rights. And it wasn't until 1989 when finally the Convention of uh, the Rights of a Child was adopted by all the nations in the world and the ratification of it took many years from 1989. And many of you probably heard that the United States is the only country in the world that did not ratify it. So for us as a Korchak USA, it, it's a very important uh, message that we really need to stand by the children. We need to give them the voice. If you go again on our website, you can read about um, children's rights, there is actually a banner on the top of the, of the screen. And I have created a project where I go to the woods, to different places, and I create orienteering trails where children actually go learn orienteering. And while they are doing the orienteering, they learn about children's rights. We have to come up with creative ideas that will allow us to bring this information to the children. I just want to pipe in here. We're getting a lot of comments from people. It looks like you have personal connections to Dr. Korchak, which is very special. And if you have any of those stories that you'd like to share, please contact Mariola so she can uh, keep track of all of them. We have one from someone named Paulina who says that actually in the orchestra pick, her father is the boy playing the mandolin on Dr. Korchak's right. And his name is Shulam wow. Dembinski. Wow, 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 that's, incre that's incredible. Uh, there were some questions that came in on the, uh, the Zoom chat. One had to do with uh, if there was religious education in the orphanage. And uh, as far as I know, the holidays were celebrated, but it wasn't like there were, you know, there wasn't religious teaching in the orphanage, uh, in the orphanage itself. We can't, did you want to add something, Marsha? 
No, I just said right. There, there was no oh, oh, okay. instruction. All right. Also, uh, just wanted to say, uh, I guess your uh, Paulina Kowalski had message saying that the orchestra picture uh, uh, yeah. had, her, had her father on the mandolin on, on the, just to the right of Dr. Korczyk. Yeah. There's so many stories that are, that are alive that if one just has to read so much about him. Uh, we hope that one of, the, one of the outcomes of this program is that people will start to be reading more and more books about it. Uh, one of the uh, one of the questions that came here on the Zoom side is how do we find a way to stop the use of children in the Palestinian society from becoming suicide bombers using his methods? And uh, I think that you know it's a wonderful idea, as we said, to you know to try to spread his teaching to to classes all over. I think that when uh, when we educate children that that all people are equal, uh, that, you know, we are all, uh, you know, we are uh, all created in the image of God, and we see the other just as we see ourselves, uh, then I think that it's going to be much more difficult to get involved in, in killing where the other person becomes not a person, but a inanimate object that you can just uh, that you can just kill. And obviously, when a child begins to value their own life the way that Janet Korczak made every child feel valued, a child will feel valued themselves and would not want to be involved in anything where they are, where they are, killing, uh, where they are killing themselves in the process of, of, killing, uh, of killing somebody else. Gail, do you want to tell us about the movie uh, coming out? Yes, so I just urge you to uh, check your mailboxes. We'll be sending out a flyer for a discussion and Q&A with film expert and child of survivors Annette Insdorf about the film uh, Korchok, which was by Andre Vida, uh, which was quite controversial at the time, but now has become accepted as the most reali realistic depiction of uh, what took place in the orphanage. And Annette, um, Annette Insdorf is a uh, very special person. She's a professor at Columbia University in film. She has a, uh, a film program called uh, fi uh, Real Films at the 92nd Street Y. And uh, I think it will really be a real treat to try to understand uh, Korchak from uh, the way he is portrayed in, uh, in this very important uh, uh, feature film. I'd like to thank 2G Greater New York, Ellen Backner Greenberg, and 2G, 3G NY, David Wax, and uh, Kale White for organizing this event and really for giving Janusz Korczak a voice. And it's just so incredible that, you know, we're seeing uh, and we have found people that are, that are connected to uh, Janusz Korczak who perhaps have not had an opportunity uh, to share their connection. And hopefully this will continue to, uh, to spread uh, his ideas uh, throughout the world. And I hope that many people listen to, uh, to the conversation that we had tonight as we have it, uh, if people have not had an opportunity to see it, there will be a link to it that uh, people will be able to see. And so please share it with, uh, with your friends, your relatives, uh, so that we can continue to spread uh, the work of this Jewish very unsung hero. So thank you everybody uh, for this very enlightening conversation and, uh, and for giving Janusz Korczak a, the voice that, uh, that he deserves so that he can continue to make a difference in the world the same way that he made such a difference in the world for, uh, for really millions of people who listen to his, uh, to his radio program. And please buy uh, Marsha Talmadge's book. I think there is a, a link to it, and uh, and I think that you will really um, you will really enjoy meeting some of the children and what they learned from Korchak and how it influenced them in the lives that they had in Israel. 
So thank you everybody so much for joining us this evening and looking forward to, uh, to seeing you uh, for, the, uh, for the movie. Um, yeah, if you uh, if you need, I put I put in the I put in the chat uh, Marsha's email. If you want to buy her book, please email her directly. Thank you, Eva, again, Matt, Marsha, Mariola, Ellen, Kale, for all participating in this. Um, just want to let you guys know I put in the chat too. Uh, on the, our next three GMY's next event is uh, next Wednesday, July eighth, featuring our founder Dan Brooks. And uh, if you want to see what it's like with our education program of putting 3G speakers in classrooms, this is the event for you. We're gonna feature a speaker every other Wednesday for the rest of the summer to show you what we're all about. So thank you everybody for joining. Thank you and uh, good night everybody and stay, uh, stay safe and healthy and sane. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, good. <laughs> Bye everybody. Thank